Hello and welcome to part four of this tutorial on practical software defined underwater networks. My name is Chinmay and in this part we are going to be talking about sensors and the internet. Specifically we are going to be talking about underwater sensors or in general underwater devices and how they can be connected to the internet using underwater networks. Um, we would be looking at some uh, terrestrial networks inspired layers of abstraction and how they can be uh, used in underwater networks to make a very simple job of connecting um, any kind of sensor or device that generates data or needs some kind of a control uh, and having that all of that sort of connected over into the internet. Uh, specifically, we'll be looking at sockets, we'll be looking at tunnels, and we'll be looking at how you could connect sensors to the internet in general. So when I talk about sensors and devices, specifically in this part, uh, in general, I mean anything that's underwater that either generates data or uh, needs to be controlled by a, 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 some form of a, a node externally uh, and is connected to an underwater network. Uh, this could be actual sensors, ADCPs, kind of sensors mounted at the bottom of the sea. Uh, this could be EUVs, this could be ROVs, this could be anything uh, that's uh, inside the water that's connected to a network and that uh, is uh, needs to generate data or send data. Um, we'll be using uh, an example network in this uh, part of this uh, tutorial as well. This is very similar to the example network we saw in the previous slide. This is a couple of uh, changes. One is we don't have node five, we removed it. Uh, we don't need it for this example. Uh, and a node four uh, has this dotted line that's connected to the internet. So uh, if you see node four is uh, deployed at the surface of the sea, this is at uh, five meters depth. Uh, so you could think of this as something, maybe a node that's connected to the buoy uh, and the buoy has a Wi-Fi backhaul uh, connected to the internet, or maybe it has a SATCOM uh, connection to the internet. So some form of a connection from this node to the internet uh, to a user who is sitting on the other side of the internet, maybe in a lab, in an office, somewhere uh, and that's connected through the internet to this node. Uh, so what we'll look at is how we can get this user uh, access to some of these uh, underwater assets like uh, the sensors uh, that are mounted at the bottom of the uh, sea. So node two here, as you can see, is deployed uh, at uh, minus 30 meters. So that's 30 meters depth. So you could think of it as something that's at the bottom of the, of the sea. Uh, using some of the other network uh, assets we talked about in the previous part of the tutorial. So let's look at some simple scenarios and we'll sort of build up from there into slightly more complicated scenarios. So uh, a simple scenario in a network like this would be that uh, you want um, the data from the sensor that's attached to node two uh, to be sent to node one. So you can, you can imagine that the sensor is generating data at a regular interval uh, and you want to send this data to node one. Now node one is also a surface node. So you could think of it as uh, a boat or something, a node that's attached to something on the surface that comes in and wants to retrieve the data out of node one. So it's a simple task, send data from node two, receive data on node one. Uh, and this could be a really, um, you know, realistic scenario. This could be something like an ADCP that's bottom mounted. Uh, and you need to get data from it every day. So every day you go over with the boat and you get data out of it. Uh, or you could have uh, something more real time like a strain gauge that, at, that's attached to an underwater structure. And you want to know on a real time level what the strain on the structure is, um, you know, or, or to a, a, a node that's surface mounted, maybe, you know, 30 meters above the, above the node. So again, very similar, very common, very, uh, very practical scenarios. Um, that you probably might uh, face when you're out there. Um, and previously we talked about, um, you know, some of the under the lower layers of uh, internet of, of networking, uh, you could use, you know, very low level um, uh, abstractions for this. Uh, you could use, you know, draw physical layer packets and then and, and send the encode the data in it uh, and then decode on the other side. But um, you will lose some portability. You will you lose some uh, some of the features of the higher level, the higher layer uh, networks, uh, network layers like you know, retransmission, uh, you know, uh, and 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 multi-hop routing. So having a, a high level abstraction to do this, um, you know, it's very common, very uh, repetitive usage of of just sending data between two nodes uh, at an application layer. Uh, having a simple abstraction to do, to do that would be very useful in uh, many use cases. Uh, and if you look at terrestrial networks, this is something that's very common and there is a very nice abstraction to solve it, which is sockets. 
uh, sockets are very commonly used in IP-based networks. If, uh, you know, TCP, UDP sockets are very common all over. Um, and they basically provide a very simple abstraction over the underlying network layers. Um, so whether it's, you know, uh, over wireless and then wired and, you know, you know multi multiple heterogeneous networks or whether it's uh, over different data rates, you know, you know, when you're using sockets, you don't care about these things. You just, you know, as an application layer, uh, you just you just connect to the socket and then you send it and you receive data. I think that level of abstraction and simple um, access to communication is very useful when writing applications, uh, even with underwater networks. Uh, the way sockets work in terrestrial networks is there is usually a host and a port. A host is some form of a unique identifier for that node in that system. Uh, and port is a identifier for that specific application on that node. So using this combination of this host and port tuple, you can access any application on any host, can access any application on any other host as long as they are connected uh, through the network. Um, you can actually translate, translate this exact uh, concept into underwater networks. And I think having that is very useful to be able to write very simple uh, applications for doing these kind of uh, data retrieval and data transmission uh, scenarios. Um, Unit stack, which is what we'll be using for this tutorial, actually has a socket API. It's called Unit Socket API. Um, it's very similar to you know, Python style socket uh, API. Uh, and the only difference is uh, un uh, unlike uh, IP networks where you have a host and a port, a unit stacks socket API uses a host and a protocol. Now, protocol is also a number, just like port is a number. Uh, and But in IP networks, ports usually go from zero to 65535, whereas uh, in unit stack uh, protocol goes from zero to 32. So it's a much smaller number of applications that can run at the same time, uh, but uh, the concept, uh, basic concept is the same. And if you look at this code snippet on the right, um, the actual uh, protocol, uh, the actual API is very similar to a standard socket API. You uh, take a socket, you connect to a specific, or you connect the socket to a, a remote host uh, with a specific protocol number here, we're using zero. And then you just send a, a byte array, uh, an array of bytes, and that just goes over and gets uh, received on the other side. Uh, it's very straightforward, and uh, if you want to know what happens underneath, um, you know some of the uh, the lower layers, uh, what this is actually doing is uh, this is converting whatever message you send. So in this case, the string that you send hello uh, is converted into a bunch of bytes, uh, which then goes through unit stack uh, as a datagram, uh, and then goes into the water based on the physical layer configurations that it has. Um, so now this is on. Uh, let's say this is on protocol zero on the sensor side, uh, uh, and then that on node two side rather, with, uh, and then that goes over the in, into the water, uh, across the water, and uh, on host one, um, uh, at, it, it receives this this physical layer packet, which then de gets decoded into a datagram, which then gets uh, looked at, and and when the, when the node one's uh, stack sees that this is for protocol zero. It will try to find some program that's waiting for a socket message on protocol zero. And if it finds something, it will give it uh, this data. So it's not that complicated. It's not that much overhead over um, uh, you know, a basic uh, you know, frame request, a low level uh, TX frame request kind of a, a layer of communication. But it gives you a very nice and simple way of, of communicating over uh, between two um, two nodes in a network. Now, the great thing about this level of abstraction is the same code can work over various kinds of things. You could have multiple applications talking at the same time, and uh, the lower layers will deal with uh, you know Mac and all kinds of other things. Uh, similarly, you could have um, a multi-hop network, and this would still work across a multi-hop network, as you will see in a minute. But before that, let's try this out. Let's try to see if we can actually simulate this and make this work. So let's go to a demo. And in this demo, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run unit stack and I'm gonna run a simple network. So let me run unit stack first. If you have downloaded the code um, for this tutorial, you'll see that uh, this is the folder you get. That's unit stack, unit dash 3.1.0. It's a normal unit 3.1.0 release with some extra scripts and I'm going to run the IDE, which you can run using this uh, command bin slash unit sim. And that will run, um, it'll open in the browser. 
like this. I'm going to close the old one. Uh, and I am going to open the samples folder here. And I'm going to look at the sample called tutorial network part four groovy. So this is a simulation script. And this is very, very similar to the previous simulation script that you have seen in part three. Uh, there are two differences. Uh, the first difference is there's no node five. So I commented out node five. And I added this little bit of code at the bottom. So this code, uh, what it does is, uh, so N2 here is a handle to the to, uh, node two. This is the node that we have sensor attached to. Uh, and what this bit does is it adds some configuration at the startup. So whenever node two gets created and starts being simulated, it'll run this bit of code. Now, there's two parts to it. Let's just look at demo one part first, uh, and then we'll go to the demo two part, 4.2 part uh, during the second demo. So here, what we do is um, we just add container.add sensor uh, and a new sensor. So all we're adding is we're adding a new sensor, new sensor agent. Now this is a very simple simulated sensor agent uh, that generates four bytes of data and sends it over the socket uh, about every 10 seconds. So uh, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, so that's uh, the code for that can be found in classes. Uh, under the classes directory uh, in sensors or groovy. Uh, and this is again, uh, a unit agent. You, uh, we did look at unit agents uh, a little bit earlier in this tutorial. And um, again, it's very simple. It's just a way to write a simple application in unit stack. Uh, everything is an agent. So this is just a simple application. You can think of it that way. And what it does is uh, it starts and at, at, at the startup, it creates a new socket. So this is, units socket API, unit socket API. Um, it connects to uh, the peer uh, using the protocol data. So it's using the protocol called data. Uh, so this is a predefined protocol in unit stack. I believe this maps to uh, the protocol number zero. Uh, and the peer is something that is uh, just set to one. So this is going to connect to node one. Uh, and then uh, it adds this thing called the ticker behavior. This ticker behavior is think of it as a as a as a loop that runs every uh, you know few milliseconds, and that is defined by whatever this argument has. This argument is set to ten thousand, so this is going to run every ten seconds. So every ten seconds, it will execute this on tick function, uh, during which if the enable uh, variable is set to true, it is going to generate some random data and it is going to send the data over a socket. So overall, quite straightforward, opens the socket, connects the socket to the peer that we're looking at, where we're, we're trying to talk to, and then just keep sending data every 10 seconds. Uh, again, this is a, a simulator, simulated a sensor node, it's, but you could think of it as something where, uh, you know, an application that reads some data from a sensor and then sends it out uh, using a socket. So let's run this um, and now that the simulation has run, uh, we have four nodes, node one, node two, node three, node four, node two and three are not accessible from the surface, uh, but node one is, so let's go to node one. So this is node one. Uh, so this is the, the shell for node one and I'm going to write some um, commands here to, to do a few things. So first things first, um, everything is running. Uh, node two is, has the, the sensor agent running, so it's generating, um, it's generating the 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 socket. Uh, unfortunately, we enabled we disabled it, uh, so we kept it false. Um, so it's not actually sending it out yet because it only sends it out if the enable is true. So what we can do is remotely we can enable the sensor. Uh, so we can just say uh, remote shell. So you looked at uh, remote shell functionality earlier. This is a way for in unit stack to be able to control uh, other nodes. Uh, and now that sensor is enabled. Um, we should be able to get data from uh, this uh, this node. In fact, it should be sending it out on uh, the socket. Well, now on node one, we need to receive it. And usually in socket programming, uh, you need a, a, a program to receive the sockets. Now you could of course write an agent on the receive side, uh, uh, you know, proper application um, style ag uh, unit, unit agent uh, and receive it. But just for this demonstration, I am going to I uh, just write it in on the shell, uh, a quick little uh, while loop that's just going to receive uh, the data. So uh, here you go, you have a new unit socket that um, binds to the same protocol uh, and it's going to receive open. So that means it's going to receive from any node. So it'll, as long as anybody connects to it and sends data, it's going to receive it. 
and uh, in a continuous while loop. And if it does receive it, it will print it out. That's all it is. Very simple. So let's run this. And in fact, since the remote side is already sending, as soon as we enable the rece reception, it started printing out what it received. So this is going to happen about every 10 seconds. And as you can see, this is the data that's being sent from node two. So a very simple abstraction, if you see just you know a few lines of code on both sides and you can actually get data uh, quite well. Now, this is again, um, a very simple demo. You can actually make it more complicated. You can send whatever data you want. You can have all kinds of encoding involved in this, but uh, the basic uh, idea is this. So let me cancel this and let's turn off the remote side so it doesn't keep sending data in water and let's go back to the slides so that was a quick look at sockets and how you could use uh, sockets to send data in underwater network it's a very cool and easy abstraction over um, uh, sort of some of the underwater uh, network uh, concepts that we have seen in the previous part of the tutorial now let's sort of ratchet it up a bit ratchet it up in complexity and see how we can use some other features of this, uh, of, of the underwater networks uh, in specific scenarios. So let's imagine uh, instead of sending the data from node two to node one, we wanted to send it to node four. Now node four, let me move my video around. Now node four is uh, also connect, uh, it's also a surface node, but as we saw in the earlier part of the tutorial, node four is not accessible directly from node two, they are too far. Um, as, at least in this uh, simulator setup. So what we need to do is use node three as a routing point and then route the data through node three uh, to node four. Now, this could be easily done. We're using static routes that we saw in uh, you know, part three of, the, of this tutorial, or you could use something like a route discovery protocol uh, to figure this out automatically. But either ways, once the routes have been set up, uh, the same concept using the socket would work this, uh, work for this as well. Uh, you open a socket from node two to node four and you then send data over it on node four. You listen to data uh, that's coming on that protocol and you get the data. Uh, this works because uh, sockets would, uh, would hopefully use uh, the network layer and the router to be able to figure out the best way to node four and realize that it has to go through node two and automatically get routed. So this example would work uh, in that scenario as well. We are not going to do a demo on it because uh, we want to move on to the next slightly more complicated and interesting um, uh, example or, or challenge, which is uh, to use uh, two-way data and to connect it to the internet. Now, imagine you have a sensor in water and uh, that's connected in this network and you want to talk to it over the internet. So you are sitting back in your lab or office and you want to be able to connect to it uh, through node four, you have connectivity to node four to the internet, but then you want to be able to connect to node two. Now, we have solved some of these problems before. We have solved the multi-hopping problem. That's easy to solve. We have solved the two-way multi-hopping problem. It's easy to solve. Um, but a lot of times, uh, sensors are not so simple. Uh, the, the simulated sensor we, we looked at earl earlier was just generating data and spewing it out uh, on on you know something which which the unit stack application could capture and send it over the network. A lot of times sensors um, actually speak different complicated protocols. Um, this could be things like UDP or TCP or RS-232. Uh, these could be streaming protocols, could be packetized protocols. Uh, and while you could have all the intelligence uh, in, you know, in your bottom order node in node two to be able to speak that protocol and then extract data out, that is a lot of work. Uh, and a lot of times that might not be easily possible. So it might be easier to um, actually just send the entire uh, sensors data protocol over the underwater net network protocol and expose it directly to the terrestrial network. Um, this would basically mean that the data is then received um, directly from the sensor through node four through the internet at the user's, user's um, uh, location and then invert in, you know, the, the, all the way back the same way. Uh, this is um, this would be really handy, and this would solve a lot of problems of being able to communicate to sensors and other devices underwater uh, without having to write uh, all kinds of drivers and 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 you know uh, translation mechanisms in the middle. Uh, and 
again, looking at terrestrial networks, this is something that is uh, solved. This is something that uh, we use quite often in terrestrial networks, and that's called tunnels. Um, in tunnels, you basically encapsulate uh, the user protocol inside the network's protocol. So you would uh, encapsulate a sensors protocol inside the network's protocol. Um, a common example of this is if you ever use uh, Secure Shell, SSH, uh, that's effectively uh, you know, um, encapsulating the shell's protocol uh, inside uh, TCP. Uh, and and, and sort of, you know, this concept of tunneling is very common. VPNs use it. Uh, and we could use the same thing here, where you could uh, you know, tunnel the census protocol all the way through the underwater network. And... You know, if it is a protocol that can be tunneled easily through the to the internet, it can it can also be tunneled through the internet all the way to the user. So this makes uh, things much much simpler. Uh, of course, there are practical um, uh, you know limitations to this based on uh, you know the speed and latency of uh, the underwater networks. But from a usability perspective, this is a very simple way to ensure, to be able to communicate between an underwater node and a, uh, something that a user um, has. Uh, this is, uh, a, again, um, something that has uh, come out of use cases where you, know, you have uh, some kind of a custom application on the top side, which um, uh, needs to be, to, to be able to communicate with the sensor, to be able to decode the sensor's data. Uh, and instead of having to have you know, all kinds of uh, bits and pieces in the middle of software to translate all the data out, this kind of a tunnel would be able for, would be able to make the, the software in the, at the user's location directly talk to uh, the sensor and get data from it. So um, underwater networks uh, can do tunnels as well. Um, unit stack uh, supports tunnels. Uh, in unit stack world, it's called portals. Uh, unit stack has two flavors of portals. One is for uh, streaming style data. So TCP RS-232 style of data, which is more of a stream, uh, is supported by a unit stack implementation called portal. And UDP kind of packetized uh, data formats uh, is supported by a unit stack uh, uh, implementation called UDP portal. The way it works internally is very similar to what we did with sockets. It's just encapsulation. So again, if you have uh, node two with a sensor that's generating some data and that needs to send it to node four, now this time route it to node three, uh, what it happens is whatever, whenever um, the, 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 the portal um, is opened uh, from the sensor, whatever UDP packets that the sensor sends into the node. So let, let's assume here that the sensor is, is a UDP um, sensor, it, gener it stocks UDP, uh, you know, whatever pack UDP packets it generates and sends to the node, uh, then get encapsulated uh, into a unit stack datagram. So you can, uh, you can think again that, you know, the sensor data that it's trying to send uh, with a, in a UDP packet is this, is this set of numbers. Uh, and what unit stack does then is it encapsulates uh, that um, UDP packet into a very a lightweight datagram, which then it transmits over the water based on whatever the physical layer and under underlying network layer configuration is. So in this case, if you had a node three that needed to route, uh, it would go through node three uh, and then out to node four, at which point, um, you know, it gets um, depacketized from the datagram and then the node four would realize that this was a, a UDP packet meant for a portal and it would then uh, send it out on this UDP port of uh, 5005. So the sensor would send it on the UDP port of 5000, go through the whole portal, and it will mag automatically come out on the UDP port 5005. So you, the, the great thing about this abstraction is you don't have to sort of think about what happens in the middle, and you don't have to deal with the translation of uh, the data uh, in the middle of this whole chain. Um, and the same thing holds backward as well. Anything that goes into this UDP port from this side, um, you know, gets routed through this uh, uh, node three and then back into node two, and then gets output on uh, UDP port uh, 5000, which would uh, end up at a sensor. So this way you could also control the sensor, change some settings in the sensor uh, and get data out. So 
a very simple way of doing uh, this, and this works extremely well, especially with uh, internet native protocols like UDP and DCP. But um, because it goes through this trans translation layer of being converted into datagram, this could also be used to connect something like uh, a sensor that only talks TCP to uh, a, an application that talks UDP on uh, the host side. So this, this node four could then, because it's connected to the internet, um, have a user connected to it uh, using uh, um, you know uh, uh, an application that talk UDP and that way get data from uh, you know uh, RS232 uh, sensor out uh, as a UDP packet so this 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 translation into a datagram uh, is also you know a, a lowest common denominator kind of um, mechanism to be able to convert some of these data so this is a extra cool thing you can do uh, because you're already doing this translation anyway so that's, in a nutshell, how portals work. It's super useful uh, in, in being able to communicate with uh, all kinds of devices. And let's uh, do a quick demo again. We'll be using um, Unit Stack and actually we'll be using the exact same simulation as we talked about earlier. So let's go back to the simulation and let's stop it. We'll run it again in a second. Let's go back to tutorial network part four. And in this, you can see uh, let's go to this part. So we talked about how uh, N2, that startup, was uh, this, the you know configuration that ran at every every time, and the node two started up. Uh, the first bit is for the, the earlier demo. For this demo, I have uh, added two bits of course. So the first bit um, creates a new portal. So this is how you create portals in Unit Stack. Uh, you create a new portal, and it takes in two arguments. One is a port, and this is port five thousand. So this would be uh, like we said in our uh, example, let's say um, the the sensor is uh, outputting uh, UDP packets on port 5000. So uh, on node two side, we would be opening the portal on port 5000. And it also takes in the peer, which is, you know, which node does it need to send the data to? And in this case, this would be node peer would be four, which would be uh, node four in this case, uh, that would be here. Now, uh, the only thing, configuration change I have to do is I have to tell uh, the portal to use uh, the router, which means it would actually route through uh, node three. Otherwise, uh, it by default assumes a point-to-point -point network. It, yeah, it's, it basically is very simple to change it by just changing this uh, P, uh, DSP uh, parameter on the portal. The next thing I do is I add uh, a static route. I had a static route to node four via node three. So this is something very similar to what we did earlier in uh, the, tutorial, the part three of the tutorial, uh, except because this time uh, node, um, node two is uh, bottom mounted and I wanted to just come up with the static route added, I am just going to add it manually at startup. So by, by default, this node automatically has this route set up. So we don't have to manually add it later or using remote shell or anything else. This just works. So all it's gonna do is it's gonna open a portal on port 5000 and wait for any UDP packets, anything that comes over, um, you know, uh, any UDP packets that come over on port 5000, it's gonna send them, it's gonna encapsulate them in the datagram and it's gonna send them to peer, peer four. Right, so let's run this. So again, uh, very simple, uh, let me move the video over. Very simple, node one is run, node two, node three, you have no, we have no connection to them. Uh, but let's open node four since we're going to be using node four here. So I have opened a console for node four and that, there you go. And on node four, I'm going to start, I'm going to create the other side of the portal. So the, we created the sensor side and now I'm going to create the other side of the portal. And the, the code for that is also quite simple. Uh, continue that add portal. Uh, this time I, I give two different arguments. One is client IP and client IP is localhost. So this is uh, just going to create a local server instead of connecting to some other server. So it could, it could potentially connect to a UDP server on uh, the user's um, uh, machine uh, over the internet. In this scenario, I'm not doing that. I'm just creating a local server and uh, it's going to use the uh, port 5000, 5005. Uh, so that's the UDP side of things on node four. So I'm going to run it. Uh, and again, uh, like we did previously, we need to add a route. So I'm going to add a route to uh, node two via node three. So that way the reverse uh, route works as well. 
So that now the portal is set up, any packets that are coming in uh, to node two uh, will aut automatically get transmitted to uh, uh, node four uh, and out of the CDP port. So to simulate this, I have written a simple uh, Python script. It's a sensor that, it's a simulated sensor in Python. And all it does is it uh, opens a socket, uh, a datagram socket, so UDP socket and uh, generate the string and sends it on the socket every five seconds, oh, sorry, every 30 seconds. Uh, so the sleep interval is 30, so it runs continuously forever. So again, this is a very simple sensor simulation simulator and all it does is just sends UDP uh, packets. So um, let's run that. So it is going to connect to um, port, let's see that. Let's look at that port 5000, which was uh, what was the port uh, on node two. So I'm going to run that and it connected to the port and it started sending data already. Uh, to, sh to receive the data uh, on UDP port, uh, UDP data that's coming out of node four, I am just going to run something like netcat. It's just it's a simple um, UDP uh, client. And uh, we had used port 5005 there. So I'm going to use the same port now here. So Every 30 seconds, this sensor will generate some data. It will go through the network. So it will go through, um, let's see, it will go through node two to node three to node four, and it'll get depacketized. And hopefully uh, we should be able to see it uh, on port 5005, which is connected to node four. So this, this bit of data went all the way through the network and came out without changing anything. Now. Uh, my sensor is uh, not uh, two-way in the sense that it, it, it doesn't receive on the socket. Uh, it's just a simple sensor. But um, you could very easily uh, just send data back the same way. Uh, the underwater network part doesn't change at all. Uh, and whatever data you send here will actually end up back uh, at the sensor. Um, so two-way data communication over the underwater network and over the internet. Uh, using the concept of portals or tunnels. Um, it's a very nice abstraction. It's a very simple abstraction. It can be very handy in a lot of places where you know you have some legacy equipment uh, that's gonna get to, uh, the, no, to, to some surface expression node over the internet and you have some legacy sensor and you want to have them talk to each other over an underwater network. You know, tunneling its protocol through the underwater protocol uh, using some form of a very lightweight uh, wrapper is a very useful way of solving this problem. So some of the example use cases of these kind of applications, uh, whether it's sockets or whether it's tunnels, could be remote controlling AUVs, could be remotely changing settings on sensors or actuators. Uh, and if you imagine a little bit further, this could be used for uh, cloud-based management of underwater sensor networks. Um, you know, you could have a bunch of these sensors connected to the internet and have some form of a so cloud software uh, that connects to all of these over uh, you know uh, internet links and then through the underwater networks and connect them to the actual sensors and and in these kind of use cases sockets and tunnels are very useful to write you know very very abstract very simple code uh, to be able to control these things so that brings us to the end of part four on sensors and the internet. Uh, in this part, you saw how uh, we can get inspired by terrestrial networks and use uh, concepts like sockets and tunnels uh, to talk to sensors and um, or connect underwater networks to the internet. Uh, it's, it's very exciting, it's very fun to be able to do these kind of things because once you can bring some of these things into the internet, a lot of things can be uh, made, you know, can be opened up. So. I think using underwater networks as a stepping stone to connect you know, underwater devices to the internet uh, is, it opens a lot of really exciting ideas and exciting uh, opportunities. So um, the next part is an hands-on session. Uh, what we would like you to do is to try out the two demos that we just did with you, uh, demo 4.1 and 4.2 using unit stack. Um, it's actually quite straightforward. So we highly encourage you to try it out. It's very easy. As, in, as you saw, there wasn't much code uh, to write and all the code that you would need to write uh, is already provided to you. 
So it's mostly a matter of copy pasting that code and trying it out. But, um, you know, do feel free to play around, uh, try out different things, change, you know, parameters here and there and see what happens. Uh, and if you ever get stuck or if you have any questions at all, um, whether it's regarding unit stack or how you could do some of these uh, abstractions into underwater networks uh, and connect devices and, and, and uh, internet to them, uh, feel free to ask in the chat. The chat's available uh, at um, the, the, the Ocean's Training website uh, for this tutorial, as well as uh, if you have any more questions, um, you can check out this website, uh, subnero.com slash Ocean's Training. This is where you'll find all the resources for this tutorial, including um, code, uh, slides, videos, uh, and also um, make a way to contact us. So if you have any more questions, even after the tutorial is, is, is done, uh, just you know, go over to the website and try and, and just you know, send us a message and we'll be more than happy to help you out. Also check out Unit Stack 3, the website. Uh, there's a lot of um, documentation and you know, um, uh, a lot of material there that explains to you how some of these things could be done. Uh, also, it has a lot of documentation about the stack itself and how you can use it in various scenarios. Next is part five of the tutorial and Prasad will be going through some really interesting things you can do uh, in underwater networks uh, re with regards to positioning and localization. Uh, so just, just hang in there and, 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 and check out part five when it's ready. Until then, as I said earlier, um, you can visit subnero.com slash oceans20 for slides, code examples, and all the other resources from this tutorial. Thank you very much for listening to this part of the tutorial, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the tutorial. Thank you.